All right. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, you're in the right place for doing a webinar tonight on top five ways to improve home energy efficiency. Uh, Brendan Schaefer will talk all about that. But before we get there, we have a, a special announcement about our services. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about that. So as we get started today, I want to take a moment and acknowledge where uh, we're speaking to you from. So uh, we are in the Waterloo region in the Grand River watershed. It's located on the traditional territory of Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Neutral peoples. We recognize the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements, and their contributions to our community. We value their traditional knowledge about how to live sustainably on this land that we share and that we will leave for future generations. So a little bit about REAP before we get started. Uh, hopefully you, you know about us if you've signed up for this webinar. We're an environmental charity. We've been active in the Waterloo region for more than 20 years. We focus on home energy efficiency, healthy yards, waste reduction, and water conservation. And our vision for this community is by empowering our community to take action today, we can leave our children a community that is more resilient, vibrant, caring, and sustainable. We're going to have a few remarks tonight. Uh, we're going to start with the MPP for Kitchener Centre, Laura May Lindo. We're going to welcome Lou Roberts, a volunteer from the Ontario Trillium Fund, to uh, and Patrick Gilbride, Gilbride, our Associate Director at Reap Green Solutions. Uh, and they're gonna talk about funding that we received from the Resilient Communities Fund that's helped uh, improve our system so that we can better serve people in this community. And then Brendan's gonna start talking about top five ways to improve home energy efficiency. Um, so with that, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll welcome Laura May Lindo to share a few words. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I am actually tuning in from my home in Kitchener as well. So as you heard, land that's been held down, cared for, loved, stewarded by the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the neutral people. Um, and I've been taught uh, that when I'm doing a land acknowledgement, that the most important piece for me is to actually make a connection between uh, the realities of having a conversation on um, stolen land uh, and the topic of the conversation that you're having. So for me, it sometimes adjusts the way that I uh, come in and speak to folks. And when I'm here in my capacity as the member of provincial parliament for Kitchener Centre at a time where uh, the Trillium Foundation has funded such an important project, the very first connection that I make uh, is to the ways in which Indigenous communities have taught us through doing um, of the importance of connecting or, or of protecting, sorry, Mother Earth. Um, and oftentimes when we're facing large scale problems like climate crises um, and environmental issues that involve uh, a lack of funding when it comes to a lot of the, the bigger changes that we want to see that we feel in our hearts would make the biggest impact, the reality is uh, it often takes all of us, every single one of us doing things that are within our capacity that actually amounts to the big change that we're looking for. And so I get really excited when I find out that, that um, Ontario has invested in important programs uh, like the ones that are offered through REAP. Um, because to me, it means that they're giving us an opportunity as individuals to take part in building the solution and building the world that we want. REAP does such amazing work in our community. Um, they're a leader when it comes to trying to teach us individually and in our own homes about the things that we can do um, to protect the, the planet and feel like we're part of a solution instead of just sort of feeling overwhelmed by the big problems in front of us. Um, and to know that I get an opportunity to be here with all of you and say congratulations. I just, I feel very, very blessed to be in this position. So thank you, Reap, for everything that you do in community. Keep on doing this amazing work. And I hope to be at more and more of these announcements where more funding comes your way. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, Lou, did you want to say a few words from the Trillium Fund? Um, yes, thanks. Um, so, Paju, Ani, hello. Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Lou Roberts. I am an, an Indigenous member of this community, but I'm uh, speaking today as a member of the Ontario Trillium Foundation's grant review team in the Waterloo, Wellington, and Dufferin region. 
I'm honored to join you all today to celebrate your accomplishments as a valued organization in the community, as well as to congratulate you on the resilient communities funding you've received at o from OTF. As an agency of the Government of Ontario and one of Canada's leading granting foundations, this year OTF is celebrating 40 years of grant making in Ontario. Since 1982, OTF has been working to build healthy and vibrant communities across the province. With an initial budget of $15 million, OTF has grown significantly and now invests over $100 million annually into communities and organizations such as yours. Last year, OTF invested in over 2,000 nonprofit-led community projects and partnerships. Our mission remains simple, to help build healthier, more vibrant communities across Ontario. We are proud to support organizations like yours and know that the $46,200 grant to modernize your IT infrastructure and train your staff to enhance your capacity and increase your program participation will go a long way towards doing just that now and into the future. Before I wrap up, I want to thank you and your organization for choosing to work with OTF and for giving us the opportunity to help you make positive impacts and contribute to your community. So congratulations once again, and thank you for having me here today. Wonderful, thank you so much, Lou, for those words. Uh, and I'll pass it over to Patrick Gilbride, our Associate Director. Thank you, Tim. Just got to find the mute button. <laughs> uh, and thank you, uh, Lou and uh, MVP uh, Laura Maylindo for the for the kind words. Um, so as as we entered the beginning of the pandemic nearly three years ago, our organization never had a greater need for a way to ensure that people were able to access our services safely. The services REAP offers are important tools that community members utilize to make changes in their lives that will have a genuine impact on climate change and adapting to its effects. Thanks to the, thanks to the OTF Resiliency Fund, we have been able to invest in our customer service systems so that we can continue to work with people in their own homes and throughout our community. This need has never been more important and urgent since the start of the Greener Homes Program at the start of last year that has seen a big increase in demand for our energy evaluations. As our new customer service system is rolled out, we now have a simple and efficient way to book energy evals and track people's improvements as they make a transition to more sustainable homes. This investment in our systems will allow our team to not only handle the challenges of the past three years, but will set us up to grow and meet the challenges that we know our community will face in the coming years. We're grateful for this financial support provided by OTF, as well as from our MPP, Laura May Lindo, and for our many supporters who attend webinars like this one. At this point, I'll turn it back to Tim to introduce our speaker. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for those kind words. Um, all of our uh, honored guests are welcome to stay. If you want to learn about home energy efficiency, uh, you're also welcome to sign off if you have other things to attend to. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us. Brendan Schaefer is going to talk tonight about how to make your home energy efficient. Um, Brendan has been a registered energy, energy advisor with Reap Green Solutions for five years. He's personally evaluated more than 170 homes and helped hundreds of people make their homes more sustainable. Uh, and I know speaking from personal experience, Brendan is the first person who we reach out to when we have questions about our own homes here at REAP. So he's a very trusted source on this stuff. Uh, he's gonna talk to you about the top five things that he recommends. While Brendan's talking, you're more than welcome to ask questions. There's a Q&A feature at the bottom. So if you put your questions in there, Brendan will have some space at the end to address those. Uh, and uh, enjoy the talk. Uh, thanks a lot. Take it away, Brendan. Thanks, uh, Tim. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. Make sure I get the right one. That's good. All right. So is that showing up OK, where you can see my screen now, my uh, the presentation? Great. 
Yeah, so today we're going to talk about, thanks, thanks everyone. Today we're going to talk about uh, the top five ways to improve energy efficiency. Um, we went through the Terry Authority on acknowledgement already, so I'll skip that one. But the top five things that that uh, that are typically recommended to homeowners when when we do an energy uh, evaluation in a home um, are these: uh, insulating the basement, the foundation, um, insulating exterior walls um, above above grade, uh, insulating the attic, uh, switching from a gas furnace to an air source heat pump, and that's one that. Um, is really starting to be much more common now. There are some special incentives to do that, and, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, when we get there. Uh, talk, we're going to talk in detail about all of these a little bit more. Um, and then the last one being an upgrade to a, a heat pump water heater. So these are sort of um, the, the most typical things that, that we find uh, when we do an energy audit on a home, an energy evaluation, um, these these tend to be the top things that that uh, that that should that need to be done and that's that save the most energy in a home. Um, but let's just look first of all when you're looking at um, upgrading your home to be more energy efficient. It's important to 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 know how to set your priorities or some things to think about when setting your priorities about which things uh, you're choosing to uh, to upgrade. First of all, you want to look at which upgrades are going to save the most energy and um, you know that that seems pretty obvious, I suppose, but um, but there are choices to make when you when your um, when your home investment dollars are are involved. Uh, there are are always um, aesthetic things or or things to make your home more beautiful. Uh, you know, we often talk about the sexy things being like uh, granite countertops and that sort of thing. Um, but uh, saving energy is is um, is probably when you're looking at at uh, upgrades that obviously for for making your home more efficient, you want to look at what saves the most energy, but also you want to you sort of have to weigh the cost of the upgrade versus the the savings. So there's always this this balance back and forth. There there may be something that saves you. Um, uh, there may be one thing that saves you the most energy, but the cost of that one thing may be just um, so much more than than uh, any of the other things that you might do. Uh, you might be able to, able to do five other things that cost only half as much and save just as much energy. So it's really a matter of balancing uh, how much you're going to save by how much that particular item costs. Um, and another element that you want to look at is trying to uh, improve the building envelope first. Uh, the building envelope is basically relates to the exterior walls and surfaces on your house, like your attic and your exterior walls and your basement. Anything that's a barrier between you and the outside um, environment. So that mostly entails um, things related to insulating your house, um, uh, upgrading windows, those sorts of things. It's important to do those, um, those sorts of things First, before you do say things like um, replacing, upgrading your uh, heating system to a more efficient heating system, mechanicals, those sorts of things, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to reduce the amount of heat that we need in the house before we install new equipment to provide that heat. Um, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, particularly because you want to make sure that the equipment that you're installing, the heating equipment that you're installing is the right, is sized properly for the amount of heat that you need. If you have a, a system that's way too powerful, way too big for your particular um, heat load needs, uh, it's not as efficient. And so you want to have the right size. So it's important to, um, to think about improving the, keeping the heat in first and then improve, improving the efficiency of the, of the heating equipment that provides the heat. Um, another thing you wanna think about is uh, which upgrades reduce the carbon emissions the most, basically which things are the most environmentally friendly. I, you know, it, it, it seems, it, it would seem like being more energy, if, some, if something is more energy efficient, it, it is also going to reduce your carbon emissions. And that is true. 
but it isn't always the same thing as uh, there, there's sometimes a difference between reducing your carbon emissions and reducing your utility bills. So they tend to go hand in hand, but sometimes they're not the same thing. And we're going to see that with a few of these things, like um, if you change your furnace to a heat pump, for instance, you're changing from gas fuel to electric fuel, and you're going to save a whole lot of energy, but your bills might not be a lot different, at least not right now. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that um, later when we're, when, we're, when we're getting more in depth with uh, uh, the, uh, the upgrade about um, heat pumps. Um, another thing that you want to consider is the grants and incentives that are available. You do want to take take advantage of those things. They can help offset the cost um, of some incentives that I'm sorry of some upgrades that might be more expensive and might not really um, without the grant that incentive sorry without the grant that upgrade might not um, might not be worth the cost and that's what incentives are sort of designed to do is to lower the the cost so that it is um, more economically feasible to do that. So you don't want to be completely dictated by what incentives are out there. You certainly want to do what's best for your house um, and what your needs are and, and what, um, you know, what's going to save you the most energy. But you also want to keep in mind um, for timing purposes and when you do certain things that you want to, if there are incentives uh, available today that might not be available in a year, you probably want to take advantage of those and do those things while the incentives are still there. So the first one we'll talk about a little bit more in depth is insulating the uh, the basement or the foundation of your home. This is probably the most common thing that uh, is the number one recommendation for for homes. If if your home does not yet have um, a finished basement or more to the point uh, an insulated basement, if you're if if there's no insulation in your basement, this is probably when 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 we do an energy audit, uh, we take. A bunch of information we go and look at your home and we take a bunch of information about the home and then we put it into a computer program which tells us how much uh, energy you might save by improving different things or how much energy is being used by different components of your home and oftentimes i should say almost always if the basement is uninsulated that is the biggest drain on your heating bills so uh, it's really one you want to look at closely if you're if yours uh if your basement isn't already insulated um, so, and if, I'm going to go over a few um, details about what you want to think about for insulating your, your basement. Um, you want to make sure to not leave any sections of your basement bare. You, you want to insulate all of the wall areas if you can. I see a lot of homes where most of the walls are insulated, but maybe there's a section here or there which was more difficult to insulate and didn't get insulated. Maybe it's behind the furnace, or maybe it's in an area where there's a lot of plumbing pipes and things by the wall, and it's difficult to do. The problem is, if you don't have every last um, inch of your walls covered, it's it's an avenue. It, it's just leaving open an avenue for the heat to get out. It's a little bit like leaving a hole in the bottom of a water bottle, because um, all that water can drain out that one spot. In this case, if you leave a, a one small section of your basement walls uh, uninsulated, that is is a really cold spot where all that heat's gonna um, gonna congregate, and the the heat is gonna go to the to the coldest spot and and just get out uh, in, in that in that spot the most. So really, do try to to cover all of your walls when you're insulating your basement. Another thing you want to uh, watch for: a lot of homes only have maybe the top half of the basement insulated. Um, there was a a time not too long ago when this was common practice, and I believe sometimes it's still done, uh, even if you have a fairly new home, um, sometimes only the top half of the walls are insulated in your basement, or maybe the, the insulation goes down to about two feet above the ground. You really want to cover the whole, the whole um, uh, wall because, again, it's like having a small section, like I just mentioned, um, even though it's not I think the reason why this is, had been done and the reasoning when builders had done this is that below the ground, it's not as cold. Uh, the outside of the wall is not as cold because it's under the ground. It stays at about 14 degrees all year round. So it's not as cold under the ground. So uh, I think that was the, the reasoning for leaving the bottom parts of the walls uninsulated. The unfortunate part is, the unfortunate reality is though that the heat doesn't have to go directly through the wall to the, to the ground outside. Um, it, if there's a, if there's a place for it to, to go, um, 
it's going to the heat will go the wall is going to be cold because um uh because it's exposed to the outside and from the top and so the the heat will go directly into the concrete of your basement and then up through and out um sort of like a, a channel for the heat to, to go through so again it leaves a a, a heat um a bridge, a, a, a thermal bridge, uh, which means that that heat can get out through the, it, it, it can go directly up the wall. Once it gets to that concrete, that cold concrete, it can go directly up and out. So it really doesn't make sense to leave part of your basement walls, um, the lower part of your basement walls uninsulated. So you really wanna try to get it all insulated if you can. The other thing you wanna do is make sure to do, deal with any moisture issues before you put insulation in. Um, basements being the lowest part of the house, uh, is where you are most likely to have issues with rainwater coming in or just moisture wicking in from the outside from the ground. So you want to take care of those things first. And there are things you can do about that. Um, you probably want to talk to a, a contractor that deals with those things and, and make sure that you don't have a lot of um, water getting in through your basement. If you have cracks in your basement, you want to fix those things first. Um, so you really want to make sure that that um, moisture has somewhere to go to, to or doesn't doesn't get in uh, and if it does get in, that it has somewhere to go, that it's not going to ruin your insulation. If you just, if you have walls that tend to get wet in the winter time or in the spring, and you put, say, some types of insulation, particularly insulation bats, and they get wet, um, that's going to, they're going to deteriorate very quickly. So you want to avoid that happening, um, either by putting a, a barrier or a um, uh, or waterproofing your basement. Um, different methods you can do used to do that but it is important to take care of those things before you then finish finish the walls with insulation um the other thing that you want to make sure is at the top of the wall in your basement where the wood meets the concrete where your wood floor joists meet the concrete this is a really common area for air leakage to get in so you have a lot of draftiness in the house because of that so you want to seal that up really well oftentimes that's done with a, a spray foam insulation and um so this is something you want to pay, pay close attention to before you uh, finish putting up the drywall and those sorts of things, usually before you even insulate the walls. You want to seal up and insulate that, that header area up on, at the top of the wall. And um, just in terms of how do you insulate your basement, there are a lot of different ways to do it. And I can't, I can't tell you, uh, it, it depends on the specifics of your basement, what's going to be the best option. But I just wanted to talk about some of the different ways that you that, that you might um, finish your basement. There are sort of uh, finished versus unfinished basements. E either way, it can be insulated. Uh, it, finished meaning if it's got framing and drywall on it, and it, you know it's ba basically a, a living space. Even if it's not a living space, though, you can still uh, insulate it with, say, an, 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 uh, in a blanket insulation, or you can have it spray foamed and then have a, uh, a special fireproof um, uh, paint put over the top of it to protect against uh, the fumes from that um, foam in case of fire. That's an important aspect, actually. Whenever you're using spray foam insulation, you, you, um, you're required to, uh, to have a fire barrier because if it burns, that creates toxic fumes and you don't want to, um, to be exposed to that. Um, but there are different types of insulations that you might use in a basement. Fiberglass insulation is often used in basements. That's the pink fluffy type of thing that you're probably familiar, probably most familiar with. Mineral fiber is also called rock sol. It's a uh, sort of a rock wool type of um, uh, insulation. Foam board is like a stiff um, styrofoam board type of insulation. And then there's spray foam, which is sort of sprayed on or injected into walls. Um, and basically all of these are used with basements pretty regularly. It's better, uh, generally in a basement, it's a better option to use something that's not going to be affected by moisture. So fiberglass is maybe not the, the, um, the first go-to that you want to, particularly if you have moisture uh, issues in the, in the walls of your basement. Uh, you might think about some of these other types of insulations that, uh, that, would, that would be more appropriate. Um, you also wanna look at the depth of the insulation, the depth of the, um, uh, how thick the wall space the gap in the wall is that you have to insulate um the the thicker that space is the more insulation you can get in there of course and the better um the better insulation value you can get 
So whether it's a two by four wall or a two by six wall, so if it's you know four inches deep or six inches deep, basically, is going to make a difference in how insulated it is. Um, you know that's going to affect the space that you have available in your basement. Uh, if you add um, framing that's that's thicker, it's going to take more space out of the basement. Oftentimes, the basement space is not as much of an issue as it is in the in the upper part of the house, but but it is something to consider. Uh, so, you know, those are, are sort of some of the main things to think about when insulating a basement. Um, and then the incentives. Um, there are incentives available for insulating your basement right now, um, up to $2,000. Those are typically, this is with the, um, the Home Energy Rebate, Her Plus program, Home Energy Rebate Plus. Um, formerly, was, it was the Greener Homes program. Uh, it's kind of still the same program with a new name now this year. Uh, it's a little bit different uh, the, the, the way the program is run, but the incentives are still coming from uh, the same basic program. And so for, for insulating your basement walls, there's one that's available up to $2,000, depending on where you live and uh, how much of your uh, basement you insulate and, and to, what, um, uh, to what insulation value you, you, you insulate it. So if you insulate it, to a, a higher uh, insulating value, the the, uh, the grant's going to be higher. So it's variable depending on those things. But you can see that on the uh, you can see the details about that on the site for the the program. Um, so here's a bit of a picture of what a basement wall might look like before it's insulated. You see, it's kind of just a bare concrete wall. Um, it it some of the challenges uh, with basements I touched on a little bit. You sometimes have um, maybe plumbing or wires or different things that are right next to the wall that can make it difficult. Um, in those cases, sometimes the spray foam type of insulation is easier because uh, you don't have to worry about trying to get the framing or insulation behind the pipes or around the pipes. It, it, it works out a little bit easier that way. But um, this is a picture of some spray foam insulation that has been applied with a framed wall here. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to have a framed wall when it's spray foam insulation. It's one of the um, advantages of spray foam insulation that you don't necessarily have to put in a framed wall. You, if, if you're not going to use it as sort of a living space, you could just spray the foam right onto the, the concrete wall. But this is where um, it's sprayed in between the framing, and then you would put drywall over the, over the framing here. So uh, the next one that I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, the exterior walls, meaning the, the above grade walls. Uh, we were talking about the basement walls, and now we're talking about what's in the rest of the house and the walls. This is really important, and, and uh, it, it's perhaps, I put it as the second thing because um, more, it's more common that, that wall, your walls in a home um, are already insulated. Uh, it certainly isn't always the case. A lot of older homes have very little or no insulation in the walls. Um, and so, but this is a really important one to think about. So the first thing you want to do is to find out what type of, a, what the wall structure is. So do you have a space in that wall that you can insulate? Um, usually you will. It's usually a wood frame, uh, like we were looking at just now in the picture where, where you put up a, uh, uh, where there's a uh, two by four frame wall or a two by six frame wall. And there's a space in there between those studs where you can put insulation. Um, sometimes, however, in, in our community, there are quite a few homes that that is not the case. Uh, there are uh, houses, a lot of houses that are what we call double brick houses. This is particularly homes that are maybe um, 100 years old or close to that. Sometimes they just have two rows of brick and then two layers of brick and then just um, a little bit of um, wood lath with plaster on that kind of just right up against the brick. And there's not really a, a space to add a lot of insulation. There is a small gap um, behind, right behind the plaster, but it tends, to, it's usually only maybe three quarters of an inch to an inch. Um, and so it's a lot less space to insulate. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. There are ways to insulate that, but it just makes it much more challenging. Secondly, um, you want to know what's in your walls already. Are your walls already insulated? Uh, we usually, when, when we're doing an energy evaluation, we, we look at this by, we try and um, determine this by taking off the uh, faceplate of one of the, the electrical outlets. And sometimes you can sort of um, see around the edge of the, um, the outlet box 
we take a little wooden skewer like you might use on your barbecue when you're making shish kebabs or whatever, you can get them at the grocery store. Take a wooden skewer and sort of poke in uh, beside the the um, the box to the uh, sorry in beside the outlet box to see how far it goes before it hits a hard surface, and then you can pull it out and see how um, deep that cavity is. Is it only an inch, or is it four inches, or is it six inches? And that gives you an idea of how much space you have to insulate. Um, and that gives you the how much space, and also you can poke into it and see is there any insulation in there already. You can sort of poke around and, and tell if there's insulation already. Also, you want to well, you can insulate it either from the interior or from the exterior. It's more common to do this from the interior, uh, and it tends to be easier to do. So that's usually what we're recommending, um, but it can be done from the outside as well. It's easier on some homes than others to do that. Um, if, if you have siding on your house already and it needs to be replaced, when you're taking off that siding, you can put insulation in from the outside, um, either on the surface or you know, in between the framing that way. But more often it, it's, um, it's being done from the inside. And um, you know, it, there are different ways of doing it. Some, some ways where you have to remove the, um, the uh, the drywall or the plaster or the wall covering to do it, but there is a way to do it without um, having to do that. If you have um, insulation injected into the walls with uh, um, a, a hose, basically you, the the uh, the contractor would drill holes at different points in the wall and then just drop a hose in and inject either cellulose, which is a, a newspaper based product. It's basically a ground up newspaper type of thing. It's a really good insulation. Um, or a spray foam that uh, uh, that a, a more of a pore foam, injectable foam that can be injected into the wall. So you know there are ways of doing it, and that way you don't have such a big, um, huge renovation uh, in your house. If, if you're going to tear out the walls in your house, oftentimes you have to move out for a while to do that. It's a real you know it can be a real hassle unless you're you know renovating it before you move in or something like that. But in general. Um, uh, the injected uh, method is is a lot easier and, and a lot more common, I think, for 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 most houses. Um, but you also want to consider when you're insulating, however you're insulating, you want to consider the air sealing properties of the insulation. Heat go heat can get through directly through your walls and through the surface of your wall and then go, get out that way. But um, it can also get out through the air by what we call convection. Basically, if 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 warm air from your house get is getting out. For instance, if you had a window open would be a, a, an extreme um, example of that. You're losing a lot of heat because the air is just pumping out and that air is, has been heated. And so you're just losing heat with the air. Even if you don't open a window, on the other hand, uh, you still tend to can tend to lose a lot of heat with the air that's getting out through the cracks in the wall, just to different crevices and cracks in the walls and that sort of thing. So when you're insulated, it's important to think about um, making sure that it seals the air in, and, and that's almost as important as the insulation value of the insulation that you're putting in. So spray foam insulations tend to be um, better at this uh, and or um, injected cellulose, something that fills the area much more um, closely. Um, bad insulation is less um, helpful in air sealing. Uh, even if you put up a, a plastic sheet of um, vapor barrier that doesn't tend to keep the air from getting around it. Or if you put a nail in the wall to hang a picture, you're getting air in there, different um, ways that you could get air past that um, plastic barrier. So thinking about the type of insulation and how well it seals the air is really important too. The incentives that are available for this are um, up to 6750, depending on, again, where you live. The incentives are different it, it depending on whether you're a, 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 an Enbridge gas customer or not. Um, so the folks that are in Kitchener have different incentive values than the ones who are outside of Kitchener in, in essence. Uh, this is the, the highest, um, 6750 is the highest uh, incentive amount, um, but there are varying uh, amounts, again, based on how much of your walls you seal, uh, insulate and um, how well you insulate them, what the insulation value of them is. Uh, this is a picture, which is actually, you can see it behind me as well, uh, of our demonstration wall at our, uh, a, a wall at our demonstration house showing a bunch of different types of insulation. 
Um, we're, we've been closed down at our demonstration house for, for COVID for the past few years and not have public um, tours and things, but we're starting to open that up again. So keep an eye on our website if you want to come and take a look at this, at our at some, some examples of different things at our, um, at our demonstration house, the Reap House downtown Kitchener. Um, this is the wall which has different types of insulations with the wall open a little so you can see. The one on the right there is different types of bad insulations. Uh, this is a, um, the next one is a poor foam or an injected foam. You can see there's a little hole at the bottom here, an example of how that's injected in, and it basically just fills that cavity. Um, it can be done either in a, this is a two by four wall, and the next one over is uh, with lath and plaster wall that, that I mentioned is sometimes in homes. You can inject behind that um, and, uh, and get some insulation. The, the, the next one, which is uh, solid green there, that is more of a, a spray foam insulation, which is sprayed into an open cavity in the wall. So if you take off the, uh, the drywall and spray the, um, the insulation into that, um, that's what that one would be like. Next one's showing what it looks like. In, this is a double brick home, like I mentioned, and what it looks like without any insulation in it. Um, and uh, so anyway, the next one we're gonna talk a little bit about is uh, attic insulation. Um, attic insulation is one that is probably one of the more common uh, upgrades that that homeowners do because it's pretty easy to do and it doesn't um, it doesn't inconvenience too much that they, they can come in and do it in a few hours. And so it's a fairly easy one um, to do oftentimes if the attic is accessible. Uh, but a few things to think about. Um, you want to know how much insulation you have in your attic right now. All of these things in terms of discovering these things, the best way, of course, is to have an energy uh, audit done and, and the energy audit will, will check these things for you. So when I was talking about poking into the walls and things, if you have an energy audit, the energy evaluator is going to do that anyway. Um, but, um, but it's important to find out how much you have in your wall right now. Uh, current standards, you probably want about 16 inches of a blown insulation or, or bats, but you want it to be about 16 inches high in your attic. Um, that sort of gets you to about R50, which is the sort of the current standard for, for insulation. So if you have less than that, maybe um, we're going to see a few pictures of somatics and I can explain a little bit more about that. Um, but you want to, as I mentioned, try to insulate it up to R50 or R60, even if you can. And that's what the incentives are, are for as well. Um, it's usually, as I mentioned, a pretty simple job. Uh, you might be able to do it yourself, even if you're handy. Um, it can be done either with bats or with a spray, um, a, a sort of a blown in insulation. Sometimes if you want to do it yourself and you want blown in, you can actually rent the, uh, the machine to blow it in from the uh, local hardware place where you're buying the insulation. Uh, but typically it's done by a, a contractor that you would hire, but it's very easy to do. Cellulose, blown cellulose is the most common type of insulation used for attics right now. It's a really, actually, it's a really good insulator. It's very environmentally a, a good choice because it's made from recycled newspapers. Uh, and it just does a really good job. Um, and the incentives for addicts are somewhere uh, that the up to about uh, 2350. So depending on how much you insulate and um, how much of your attic and how, how, um, uh, well, actually, mostly that because the, the it's 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 based on how much your attic has now versus how much you uh, get, are getting it to R50. You do have to, I mean, to get the incentive, you need to get it up to R50, but you may already have R30 in your attic now, or you may have R10, you know, you may have nothing. So depending on where you're going from, uh, the grant is going to be different, the incentive. So a couple of pictures. This is what an attic with um, fairly little insulation. This is a blown in insulation. Uh, I believe this is a, a blown um, fiberglass insulation in this. But you can see that these rafters here, this is about two by six inches. So there's about six inches here. You can see it coming um, up to about the six inch mark. That's going to be um, maybe uh, R20. Um, and so you want to get that, you want to add a bunch over the top to make it look a bit more like this. It just gets blown in over the top. And that's about 16 inches um, altogether. And that gets you to about R50. So that's really what you're looking for, for uh, attic insulation. So <clears throat> once you've sort of taken care of the, the, the important um, uh, 
the envelope uh, upgrades that we were talking about. Um, switching from a, a gas furnace to an air source heat pump, this actually tends to, to, to be just about the best thing you can do in terms of saving energy in your home. Uh, I mentioned that the the um, if the basement is is unfinished and uninsulated, that is the the main um, most important priority uh, that we see when when we put the um, information into the computer program. Um, but actually, switching to a, a a heat pump is actually the other top thing and almost always the top thing that would save the most energy. The nice thing about it, well, there are a number of nice things about it. So let's talk a little bit about those things. Um, I know you may be thinking a heat pump doesn't work all the time, all winter in our climate. And that is, although that is true, um, a heat pump will not, um, might not uh, provide heat on the coldest night of the year uh, when it gets down below minus 28, but they do, Newer heat pumps now that are called cold climate heat pumps, um, a ASHP stands for air source heat pump. Um, they work all year round and they can work down to a temperature of minus 28. So you don't have to really worry so much about it not um, providing enough heat for your home. They do almost always have a backup heat system, whether that is a, um, a gas furnace used as a a backup. So if you already have a gas furnace, sometimes that is used as a backup. But more often, there's just a, um, a an electric resistance coil that uh, turns on only uh, at the times when it gets below minus 28 or below the, the lowest point that your uh, heat pump can work. But basically, from talking to people I know who have heat pumps now, who have had them in, uh, installed in the last few years, They've really rarely ever needed to, to have their backup uh, kick in, if at all. I've talked to people who have never had their backup uh, kick in. So it really does uh, work for our climate. The reason that it's so efficient is that it actually is not burning a fuel to create heat. It's moving heat from one place to another. So it's taking heat from outside and bringing it inside. Now, you might be asking, what if there's no heat outside? Well, there's always some heat outside. Uh, it does get very cold. And even when it's, again, minus 28, um, by pressurizing this coolant and by um, uh, using the, the um, means that they have now, um, we can actually pull what heat is outside and, and, and pull it in and turn it into heat that we can, that we can uh, use inside the house. So that's why it's more efficient. It doesn't have to create heat. It just has to move it. Uh, there's also what's called a ground source heat pump, which moves heat from under the ground, or sometimes called geothermal, removes heat from under the ground into your house. Uh, and you, you know, the, that's great as well, but it tends to be a more expensive endeavor, particularly in, uh, in um, uh, urban areas, because it's not easy to, um, to have those, those wells drilled to have the pipes go down, uh, that it ends up costing a whole lot of money and, um, maybe not being practical to do so in your yard. So, but, but an air source heat pump is almost as efficient as that and um, does a really good job. It's about 300% efficient rather than 900%, uh, sorry, rather than nine, 95%. So your gas furnace that you have now is probably about, if the best ones are about 95% efficient, meaning that when you burn that fuel, you're getting 95% of that energy uh, going into eat, heating your home. The other five percent is going out the chimney or going out the vent because you have to you have to vent those um, those combustion gases that are happening. Whereas a heat pump can actually bring in more heat, more energy, uh, more heat energy than it's putting out in electrical energy. So it's three hundred percent, so three times as much heat that you can get from it as the uh, energy that you're the electricity that you're using to to pull that heat in. So it really makes a big difference. It also provides both heat, a heat pump usually provides both heating and air conditioning. So this, this is actually an important point because if you're replacing your, um, your gas furnace and you're gonna replace your air conditioner as well, um, it ends up not costing a lot of difference to do this because, because you're replacing both those units with one unit that does both those things. So it really is a big benefit to have something that does both heating and air conditioning in one unit. 
Um, it uses only electricity. It does not use fossil fuels. In other words, um, sometimes obviously electricity is made from fossil fuels. In Ontario, not very much. Uh, certainly there are some fossil fuels associated, but much less. Uh, we have a very clean electric electricity production in, in Ontario, so it really makes a lot of sense. We have a lot of hydro and, and um, nuclear uh, electricity. So we're really, the other nice thing is that you can use uh, solar energy. So if you put solar panels on your house, you can create your own uh, energy for running your furnace. And uh, this is really important. And it's really important for, um, for addressing climate change. And that's a lot of what we're trying to do with making our homes more efficient. So it's really, um, uh, that's really a big benefit. The incentives for a, a heat pump, are anywhere from 2,500 to 6,500, and that can make a really um, that can make this an affordable uh, upgrade for you. Uh, a heat pump does tend to be a more expensive item than, say, a gas furnace. But again, as I mentioned, it's not a lot more expensive than uh, a heat uh, furnace and uh, air conditioner. So if you're if you're um, replacing both those things with one unit. It, it, the incentive is is designed to try and offset the cost difference between just replacing your furnace with a um, with a new gas furnace and replacing it with a heat pump. So the incentive is designed to try and um, pay you back that extra cost that it might cost up front to, to do that. Uh, this is a picture of the um, air source heat pump that we had recently had installed at our demonstration house. Because this is the outside section of the outside portion of it. They're, like an air conditioner, it has an outside uh, part and an inside part. Oftentimes, what you'll have replaced inside is just will just replace what your where your furnace is now. It it won't you don't have to have all new ducting put in or um, or no ducting or what have you. If you're already using um, air ducts in your furnace, you you can use those same ducts with the um, the heat pump that you put in. But there are of course different types of heat pumps. So. Um, some that don't require ducting, and you can you can have them put in if you don't have ducting. If you have a boiler, for instance, that uses water um, in radiators, that sort of thing. There are different types, but basically, this is the outside. They're they're very quiet, and um, yeah, just a, just a really good investment. So the other uh, upgrade that you might consider is the uh, is um, your water heater. So you can also replace your gas or electric water heater with a heat pump water heater, which essentially does a similar thing to what the uh, heat pump for, for heating your home does, only it puts that heat into the water that's in the tank. And that just makes it much more efficient because you're moving the heat again rather than, um, rather than creating new heat. It's much more efficient than conventional water heaters. And it also uses only electricity, not fossil fuels. Um, you can, again, use uh, solar um, solar PV panels on your roof to, to, to run it. Um, and by switching both your furnace and your water heater to electric, you have the option to also disconnect your, your gas service altogether. What you're paying for in gas service, um, there's, a, there's a flat fee that you pay just to have that gas service there. So even if you uh, um, are only using just a very little bit for your water heating, you're still paying that $20, $30 a month just for gas service. So if you if you can get yourself completely off of gas and onto electric uh, appliances, then you can discontinue that gas service and save that extra, um, that extra part on your utility bill that way. Uh, the incentive for a water heater is um, up to $1,300. These two do tend to be more expensive than uh, your typical water heater, and that's why the incentive is designed to try and, and uh, uh, sort of offset that cost and make it more comparable to what you would pay for a, a typical water heater. But again, you know, you always have to balance the cost of one of these upgrades versus how much you're saving. Um, upgrading to a heat pump water heater often is one of the more um, important, one of the, the top energy saving upgrades that gets recommended uh, because it would save you know, next to the the uh, basement insulation and the um, the the heat pump, the air source heat pump uh, is probably the most often one that that saves the most energy. Whether that actually trans um, you know translates into um, enough energy savings, enough utility bill savings to pay for for the uh, the extra cost of the unit, 
that's difficult to say. Uh, sometimes it, it is, and sometimes it isn't, but, um, but important things to think about. Uh, it looks a little bit like this. This is what we have in our demonstration house uh, again here. This is the top part of the, um, of the heat pump water heater. And it also has a backup in it, a, a, a resistance coil backup uh, unit in it so that it can heat up more quickly if you need it to. Or um, uh, yeah, that, that's usually what that, that's for is when, it, when you need it to be heated more quickly. Um, but in any case, it, it's just a bit of a taller tank and um, yeah, it has to work really well. So that's basically all I had to, um, to give you in terms of, um, um, suggestions about upgrading your home. We are going to, I think, open it up for some questions now. I don't know, Tim, do you want to um, read off some of the questions? If there are any questions, I don't know if there are any questions that have come in yet or... No, there are a couple in the uh, Q&A section. So the first is, my house is 103 years old and it's one and a half stories. I do not see any way to go up into the attic. How do I know how good the attic insulation is? Yeah, that can be a challenge. Um, if um, particularly with as you're what you're talking about there is what we call a story, a story and a half, where the part of the, the the ceiling is sloped on the upstairs section. Sometimes there's not an access to get in there. Sometimes there is, and it's just hard to find. It sounds like yours probably doesn't. Sometimes there's an access from the outside. Maybe there's a window going in there. Um, but if there's not. Um, yeah, it's not going to be easy to to necessarily um, uh, get up there to check it, and and we do run into that sometimes when we're doing an energy evaluation where we can't go into the attic. We basically would make some uh, assumptions based on the age of the house and the, and when it was when it was last renovated, perhaps when the attic was was uh, put in, if it was not original to the home, um, and then we can get an idea of how much insulation. Is probably in the attic um, uh, from from that information. The part the part that's that's maybe um, less of a mystery is what's in the sloped part of your attic. There's not a lot of space in there to insulate, so it's probably not a lot of insulation in there. But yeah, if you can't get into it, it's it's difficult to tell. You can drill a small hole in it, perhaps if you're if you're if you're not squeamish about that. If you drill a small hole in it, you may be able to poke in and, and see if there's any insulation in there. And then you can just cover over the hole with some spackling or something. Um, but yeah, aside from putting a small hole in, it's not really easy to tell what's up there. Great. And uh, here's one from somebody who just moved to a heat pump, but the electricity bill went very high. Uh, do you know how, how do you know if you have the right heat pump and is there somebody who can check that out? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, certainly your electricity bill is going to go up when you install a heat pump because you're switching from the, you know, from the gap, from paying for gas for, to paying more for, for your electric. It should be fairly similar, um, in, um, in other words, the amount of, uh, th that your gas bill goes down, that's how much dollar wise, your electricity bill should go up more or less. You may pay a little bit more, at least right now, um, with the uh, for the electricity because electricity is a different fuel. Um, but how do you know if you have the right heat pump? I guess, you know, the, um, the question might be not just whether it's the right heat pump, but rather how it's how it's also how it's set, um, what the settings are on it. Uh, typically, uh, with a heat pump, you have a backup heat source, and maybe I don't know the specifics of your situation that you're asking about. Uh, but if the um, if the backup source is an electric resistance coil inside the unit itself, uh, then it, um, the the way that it's um, that it that your thermostat is configured, or your way that your system is configured, uh, if that is going on too often, that backup is going on too often. Uh, that can be one cause of why the bill, uh, why your bills might be higher. So having that that set point um, where it's going to switch from the heat pump to the backup is really important. And so sometimes you can adjust that. And I, I would say you would probably just need to talk to your contractor about that and ask them uh, how you might um, adjust that. Uh, I uh, yeah, I, I can't really give you specifics about that specific situation, but 
again, I would talk to your contractor um, about it, or if your contractor is not helpful, maybe, you know, try try other contractors to to see if if there are any that that would um, you know step into that situation and look at it for you. But but really, if your um, if your furnace is if your sorry if your um, your backup is is set the right way, it shouldn't need to go on that often. So that that may be part of the issue that you're looking at. Great. And um, here's a good one about heat pump water heaters. Uh, so the questioner writes, my understanding is that a heat pump water heater is moving heat from my basement, which is heated by the furnace. So I have trouble understanding how this is saving energy in the winter. Am I understanding it correctly? Yeah, so, you know, um, there, there are different ways that, uh, different ways that this can work. Uh, oftentimes it is moving heat from the basement into uh, the water heater, so you're, that is being heated by your furnace or your heat pump, if, if it's a heat pump, however you're heating. So partly it depends on how efficient your space heating uh, equipment is, it, depending on, on uh, how that's being heated to begin with, is going to have an effect on that. But I, I, I should say there are also, also methods of um, using a heat pump water heater that do not pull the heat from the house, but pull it from outside if it's in your garage, for instance, or the ducting can sometimes pull the air uh, from the outside. You can, it's, uh, the one that, we, the particular one that we have at the Reap House, uh, you can have a, a, a separate uh, ducting kit that will uh, duct it from the outside. So it's pulling heat from the outside rather than from the inside the basement. Um, you know, frankly, in the winter, in the summertime, it's a real benefit to be pulling that heat out of your basement and into the water. Uh, obviously, in the winter time, it's 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 the opposite. So so there is there you know there are some advantages and disadvantages, but um, but overall, it is. Um, I'm I'm not a physicist, so I can't tell you the exact reason why, but I can tell you that from the um, uh, the the studies that have been done, it is more efficient, uh, even if it's from the inside, if, if it's vented to the inside. Uh, it is more efficient to to do it that way. De depend again, depending on how your home is being heated to begin with, right? Great. And keeping on the uh, water heater line, can you compare heat pump water heaters to on-demand water heaters? Sure. Yeah. And and you know, um, for for the past number of years, we had been recommending um, on-demand water heaters a lot, and there were incentives for that. Um, on demand uh, tend to be a gas uh, a water heater, so they're, they're they're using gas. That's obviously one one difference. Um, they certainly are on demand. They certainly are more efficient than a traditional water heater. Uh, probably not quite as efficient. In most cases, not quite as efficient as a heat pump water heater. They're a little bit less efficient, um, but um, and they might be slightly. The the cost is fairly similar, so they're they're going to be fairly similar in, in, in cost. Um, so, you know, I think in both cases, uh, it may not be a, um, the savings that you're going to get on your bills may not ever pay off the extra cost that you're going to incur from installing uh, either a, a, an on-demand water heater or a heat pump water heater. Um, so financially, it may not be uh, your first priority. It does save energy though. So if you're really interested in saving energy and that's your motivator, then it is actually a good, a good investment. So I guess that's kind of the, the, the comparison there. Great. Um, and changing gears to insulation, uh, a questioner writes that many contractors disapprove of foam insulation because its production generates a lot of emissions. What are your views on that? Yeah, and that is something that's important to think about. Um, you know, uh, it, I'll, 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 I will say, though, that so a, a lot of what that uh, it's not just the production of it, but the the, the material itself. Uh, a, a foam insulation or spray foam insulation or a, a board foam insulation for that matter. Um, it, it, a lot of its insulating value is the gases that are inside of the pockets in the in the foam that uh, the air pockets, but there's not air, it's gases that are in there oftentimes. 
And uh, those can be very potent greenhouse gases. Now, they're stuck inside that insulation. So they're not getting into the environment while they're in there. But there can be a case, a case can be made to say that those are eventually going to be, you know, when the house is torn down or what have you, those gases um, may be going up into the into the atmosphere and, and causing more problems that way. Certainly is an issue. But on the other hand, um, uh, there have recently been improvements in that regard into how the, the uh, foam insulation is being made so that it's much more neutral now, if, particularly with spray foam insulation, having spray foam insulation put into, uh, into your wall, that type of thing. Um, there's a new type of next generation spray foam that has a much, much less of an impact. It's more of a neutral uh, impact on the environment that way. Uh, so it, it, it has improved a lot in the last, that, that was, that's in the last maybe three years that this has become available, this, this new, new generation uh, spray foam. So, you know, with that one, uh, uh, but I do have to say, even with that in mind, you, you want to think about that and use it sparingly and use it in the right, uh, in the right situations. So it, it might not be, um, it might not be the best option for uh, doing your whole home, but in some areas where you can't get insulation around, like those places in the basement where you can't get around the pipes and those sorts of things, those areas, it might be a good, a good place for it. Um, but yes, I agree with you that if, um, if you have the option to, um, to use a more sustainable type of material, it is, it is preferable. Um, the, the benefit of sort of some of the advantages of spray foam are also that you can get more insulation value into a smaller uh, cavity. So you can get this, if you, if you put spray foam into a four inch cavity, you basically can get the same insulation that you would get in a six inch cavity uh, with a bad insulation. So in those areas where you're really concerned about space, that's another area where sometimes spray foam is a, is a, is a good compromise. Um, but yes, you definitely want to think about it. I will say though that not all spray foams are the same, and uh, the board, board, uh, the stiff board type uh, foam insulation that you might put on the outside of your house, those have not come as far in terms of environmental um, advancements. So those are a little harder on the environment uh, than the spray foams that that we're seeing. Um, the the type of foam that is injected into the walls, however is not the same. It does not have that same effect. It's not as, it's, certainly there are some, there are fossil fuels involved, but it, it's not using those same um, uh, highly um, greenhouse gases that, that, uh, that uh, the other types of spray foam, polyurethane spray foam uses. So the ones that are being injected in your wall is not the same. It doesn't have nearly as much of an environmental impact as the, um, as the other types of spray foam. So just some things to think about. Great. We are running a bit of overtime, but there's some good questions. So, Brendan, do you have a few more minutes for questions? Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll give you these two at once. Um, one is, what is the best way to insulate doors and windows? And I think related to that is, do you have suggestions on good tools to detect drafts? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Those are two two sort of very different questions, but. Um, Insulating doors and windows, you know, there's not really a lot you can do for for insulating uh, existing doors if it, um, if your door is not uh, a well insulated door. Usually, you would you would what you would do is replace it with one that is. Windows, kind of the same thing, but really a lot of it is um, it, a lot of the concern with. Um, with windows and doors is the 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 air that's getting in around them. So there are things you can do with that. You can you can um, put new uh, weather stripping around doors. You can um, you can put plastic over your windows in the winter time for to keep the air you know to give a better air seal around them. That you can buy those kits in in your hardware store uh, where there's a need to use a tape that goes around the outside. Sometimes you can use a um, a removable caulking to to caulk the the areas around windows and those sorts of things um, that certainly could help um, in terms of the draftiness of the windows. Sometimes it's also 
around the um, the trim around the window. So the the, uh, the 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 trim that's underneath or around, around the window casing, if you it, you can you can seal around that, which will help keep those the air from getting in around the windows as well. Um, I forgot what the second question was. Oh, de ways of detecting where air leakage is happening. Is that is that what the question was, uh, Tim? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a tip. That's a difficult one. Um, we do that with a what's when we're doing an energy evaluation. We uh, have a big fan and instruments that we hook up to the front door, and we blow air out so that you can feel where the air is coming in. You can go around and feel where the air is coming in. It's not easy to do without that equipment, however, but. What's really important, more perhaps more importantly, is knowing where air tends to get in and looking for those 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 areas. Um, you know, the, the most important areas for air sealing your home is in the basement and the attic, because what tends to happen is the air comes in in the in the winter time when, when you're concerned about that. The air tends to come in the basement, and because it's being heated, it goes up and goes out. Through the attic and you get sort of a wind tunnel effect what we call the stack effect and so you really want to look at places in your basement and your attic that might let air through so some of those areas um uh, and if you look at our our website and you go through the the, the virtual tour of the, of the reap house there are some there's some more resources about that but but you want to look for big gaps in the walls in your basement or in the uh, again, the header areas where it's where it's um, the wood meets the concrete. If you can see gaps in there, it, it's really important to seal around there. Um, but any sort of larger holes in your exterior walls or in your attic, uh, I shouldn't say attic, I mean upstairs in the ceiling in your upstairs that goes into the attic. So sometimes you'll have big uh, recessed lighting or your um if there's a, a an air gap where your attic hatch where your, your attic door or your attic hatch comes um if you can seal off those areas those, te those tend to be the most important ones uh to seal that said insulating your home makes a really big difference it's one of the biggest things that makes a difference in air sealing them as well if you use a, a type of insulation that seals the air pretty well so you know those are sort of your best bet uh of ways to to uh places to look for air leakage in the home. Great, and we'll just, uh, we'll do two more questions. So one, uh, the second last one, is a heat pump cheaper than an electric heater in terms of the electric bill? Definitely, yes. So uh, basically an electric electric heater, you, well, uh, I, it depends on what you mean by electric heater. Uh, there are baseboard heaters. And most, most electric uh, heaters, we call heaters, use um, electric resistance basically it has a you know a, a, a metal coil or uh, something that that uh, that provides resistance and that's where we get the heat from and that is it's 100 percent efficient because you're getting all of the heat out of it you're not you know you're not burning anything and and having any of it go up a chimney so it is you know technically more efficient than um, than a gas furnace but it's more expensive because it's not um, because electricity is more expensive than gas in that regard. So, um, so using a, a an electric heater is um, you know although fairly efficient, it's also going to be expensive on your on your electricity bills. Whereas a heat pump, because it's three hundred percent efficient, three times as efficient as a, a heater, an electric heater, um, it's going to cost. A third of what you would spend if you're using uh, an electric heater, in essence. Great. Um, and another person asks: Does improved insulation, a heat pump, etc., increase the resale value of a home? Interesting question. Um, traditionally, it has not, but we're starting to see that it does now, as people are becoming more and more aware of um, of the value uh, and uh, you know of, of utility bills going up and that sort of thing. Uh, it, it is starting to be, um, uh, and of course, it depends on what that is. Um, obviously, things that you can't see tend to be less, have less of an influence on the value of the home than in terms of the sale value, the resale value of the home, than what you can see. So depending on, you know, what that is, I think heat pumps are, certainly are. Um, insulation, maybe not quite as much, but, but um, you know, if, if you're able to really show that it is well insulated, you might be more likely to have more. I mean, you you might be more likely to have uh, more interested buyers. But 
it's you know what there's not real good data on on whether it how much it does or whether it does in, in uh, increase the value of the resale value of the home that much wonderful well thank you so much brendan and thank you very much everyone who attended uh, including our guests at the beginning uh and thank you for your time and your attention and uh, take care have a great evening Bye.